we're enthused to have you back to our, and us is uh, the Soto Brown and his Bishop Museum and me, Martin Despang and his Waikiki Grand Grand Hotel bathroom. Broadcasting live to you uh, for our show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And this time it's all about the sixes because it's our 260th show. And you are about to be our 13,966th viewer. So we thank you for that. If we can, if we can get the first slide up, please. We want to do a little bit of a correction or being precise because while you DeSoto had been speaking perfectly as always and uh, giving us the right um, positioning of this new tower that we see at the very top right which is for Howard Hughes and by the Chicago architect Solomon Coldwell Buens I got a little bit confused and said it will be positioned where our beloved uh, Ward Plaza was and that was not what you said so here we were going back which is also a good thing going back to the archives of our show and having a bunch of show quotes here and at the very bottom left we see here visualize what you correctly said which is this department store a uh, gem but spelled with an e right and there it is so thanks to me being confused and hopefully the audience not gives us the chance to revisit that and revisiting that, how do we feel about it, especially in comparison of the new they're building and our tropical exotic agenda to Soto? Well, uh, we continue to have a lot of the same quibbles or the same questions that we continue to have. And just basically to reiterate the types of things we talk about, glass boxes that are entirely enclosed are not good. Glass boxes that don't open their windows are not good. Glass boxes should have lanai's so that they are not entirely enclosed. As a second best uh, alternative to a lanai that you can actually go out on and live on is what's called the Juliet balcony, which we've discussed before and will again, in which basically you have opening sliding doors with a railing on them so that you can sort of step out a little bit or lean out, but you don't really have any living space. So yet again, we're finding that these things are not living up to the potential that they should be exhibiting and the things that they should be creating for the people who are going to be living in them. Yeah, and also the show quote at the middle left, uh, this, this side has a long history here. Well, it had our beloved warehouse on it to begin with by Steve Owl. A great piece of hippie architecture, which when I categorize in that way, our Bundit Kanistakan, who is his most utmost researcher, because we failed to get Steve out in front of the camera. He said, you guys do it on your own by yourself. And Bundit for his exhibit was able to do it before uh, Steve left us, at least physically, spiritually, he's still with us, will always be. So when that got cleared, uh, they shocked us with some Richard Meyer towers that we thought were like recycled from the 80s or something. And then uh, Richard Meyer was pulled as being the unfortunate main figure in the Me Too movement. And so were his towers here. And then they came up with this, which we thought was sort of like a little bit giving us some breadcrumbs here so we wouldn't be impatient. And that was this part that they were proposing with this weird elevated walkway that we thought was once again copycatted as, again, the, the article that is the, uh, the kind of the mentor for the show from the Biz Journal that says we have an imported skyline. That one here felt copycatted from New York City, the High Line, and we didn't quite know what was, that was good for. But then we got really shocked after that because the little show quote in the, in the middle, um, almost exactly in the middle, is uh, the Victoria Place by the same architects of Chicago, Solomon Coldwell Buons, which has no lanai's whatsoever. So once again, these Juliet lanai's that you said is sort of better than no lanai's, but it seems the same breadcrumbs. They're throwing these at us to make us not quite as disappointed. But again, this pushing and pulling of every other fourth floor isn't really, and the Juliet lanai's isn't really cutting it because us revisiting this gem uh, department store with these high rises, we're talking high end residential, right? When we had our German Chamber of Commerce 
people here with us and we toured them through Kaka'ako. We got this appointment with Howard Hughes. And there was this first uh, president who was a what, previous uh, former football player, a young guy. And when these ambitious Germans said, hey, how about sustainable features? He scratched his head and he said, well, we looked into this, but it really didn't work, you know, financially, budget wise. And we're like, give us a break. I mean, we don't let the excuse that you can't build sustainable, which we try to avoid the deflated term to begin with, uh, housing for everyone. We don't let allow that excuse either. But in high end, please not. But down there, a big box store, that's a whole different ball game. This is like the lowest in budget, right? You spend the least, you make it a box, which this one is, grantedly, but then you make it, give it a nice entrance feature, which this one here isn't just aesthetically as this push and pull wants to make it look. I mean, the top right makes me look, makes me feel like they want to make it look like the picture of palm trees, something filigree texture, but it doesn't have anything what a palm tree does. It just wants to look like that. But this entrance canopy does it on multiple levels, right, DeSoto? Yes, it does. And this is something that we just discussed. And there are two levels of protection here. And, and this is right at the front entrance of the store, which, by the way, let me just point out, was a discount store. It was a discount department store. Uh, the, the letters GEM stood for government employees something. I can't remember. You had to be a member of it. But it was a discount store, not high end. So there are two levels of protection here at the main entrance. We've got this much more high soaring thing that's got arches. It's very delicate. It does in fact perform because it does in fact cover you from the sun. It does in fact provide cover from the rain even though it's so tall that the rain can still blow in. But right over the, right over the entrance, there is this bouncy canopy that's got these arches which are not exactly the same as the arches of the bigger one, but they do mimic each other. Now, the other thing that struck me when we were talking about this beforehand is the higher canopy does mimic the appearance of one of the main structures of the 1962 Seattle World's Fair, which didn't have any performative function, but it was a symbol of that event. And it's still standing to this day in the park that was created there. So this is very much of the time period. It's of the zeitgeist, to use a German word, which is also used in English. And so this little, these, two, these touches add an elegance to essentially just the big concrete box that this building was. And by the way, that's the same building that is still there to this day, which went through a variety of other tenants, including Sports Authority, and which is now empty in preparation for demolition for the construction of, yes, another Howard Hughes high rise. And we see that we see its backside at the very bottom right on the show quote. And this is where it is fronting this park that they're, they're, they're so proud of. But you said, you know, when you when they call their um, balconies lanais, it's the same as when they call this so grandiose a park, you say it's more like a green strip or something like that, right? It barely deserves that term. They're kind of hypering it once again for marketing reasons. And they're positioning these towers slightly offset in plan so that the the, the park sort of opens right towards Kewalo Basin, which is once again also critics say it's going to be gentrified and basically be privatized, that all these people can have their super mega yachts there. And that way, we're also losing, you know, it's kind of public kind of feature for, for everyone, which is that gentrification issue we're having here. So that being said about having been digging out the history of this place here, I think where the city should make it mandatory for any developer whatsoever to visit you at work, dig out the archives and see what was there on the site before. And it should be held accountable on the performative features of that site, right? Because once again, you said this wasn't even a Bloomingdale's or a Macy's or something. That was even in already the range of a department store was on the low end. And if a low end department store does something more tropical exotic than a high end, uh, you know, uh, dwelling developer, then there's seriously something wrong. 
And again, once again, uh, top left, uh, Genie Gang's um, Kuulu Tower that we excessively covered. In this stage here, this is a very uh, well meant position looking at it because looking from very close to it above, it looks the most tropical exotic. And here, which ticked off uh, our emerging um, talent, Derek Korea, when he saw it being painted, here the concrete wasn't painted and the wrong glass guardrails weren't on. So, you know, once again, in this condition here, it looked way more tropical exotic than it is when it is a finalized thing, which it is now. So uh, next slide, which gets us back to Chicago. Here we are, a show called uh, Top Right is how we ended on, once again, uh, emerging talents uh, help us. Um, uh, Harding in my studio, who is from Arizona, when I told him about the very top ride in the very top ride picture by this architect who also built these greenish bluish glass towers, he said, Martin, and by the way, just to let you know, this is high end residential. So here we go again. This is actually something we don't even want to talk about because that's not what we need more of on the island. We need more. Uh, for the little people and for the average people and not that. But, you know, this architect does way more tropical exotic in the desert than he is doing in Chicago. And Chicago has this tricky climate. We've been talking about that um, a city that, um, you know, gets denser and denser and denser uh, while um, glass supposedly or potentially has a chance to help you stay warm through passive solar gain. Not so much in a tight urban fabric because the cities are so close to each other and they're constantly new ones being built. So you hardly ever get any sun through this glass to warm you up. And in the summer condition, that's why we threw in these uh, climate charge from our iPhones here. And sorry, Ron, that we don't have yours because you're topping as of now as last weekend, Phoenix, Arizona, because you had that heat wave of 120 degrees. And our on the phone, also New York Times newsletter blog of today was uh, adding and, you know, uh, all these uh, heat waves we had, obviously, you know, in, um, in India, big times, in China, big times, but continental US and Europe which I experienced when I was there over the summer. So global warming, less than ever, we seem to be able to argue it. And what does architecture do? We have here Honolulu and Chicago these days, and we see these similarities where we're hitting not quite as bad as you had, Ron, I had it last couple of days, but in the 90s, which is hot enough. So why in the world are we building microwaves for that reason? Uh, we shouldn't, neither there, neither here. And architecturally speaking, if we look at the towers, what are the features that we see in these zoom ins to Soto? Well, what we see several things. First of all, we see the, the, in the big picture, we see that there are windows that open and they will tilt out and we like that. What we also see are these kind of indented uh, strips, which are more probably just decoration than doing anything important. We did see in the, in the building that we've looked at already in Chicago, what is the open floor, which was placed there so that the wind could be able to blow through this extremely tall building and not cause too much sway back and forth. So that actually performed. This is probably more just for looks and so that you're not creating a completely featureless glass box. What we've also seen too is in the sort of what was supposed to be the low end Howard Hughes High rise, we've got this indentation with the yellow box, which harkens back to Miami Vice of the 1980s and the famous buildings in Miami, which got a lot of attention at that time for being so cool uh, and different. Unfortunately, that building has had a lot of problems in terms of remaining affordable and having a lot of maintenance issues and having people have to pay much higher monthly maintenance costs. So it's not fulfilling what it was supposed to be doing despite its cute appearance. We also see a, a building which is proposed for another site on Kapilani Boulevard, which is where everything is happening right now for high rise construction. And this one has a two, two towers that are connected up at the top. 
that really is, again, not something that performs better. I mean, it is nice that the wind will be able to blow through that open space, but that, again, is something to distinguish the building from the other ones around it more than it is something to really do something for the people who live in there and provide conditions that are more livable for the inhabitants. Yeah, and besides the spectacular glitzy sky bridge there, you also see these indents on the on the main tower, uh, which is again, they're not doing much. We can call them whatever blow blown in floors or something, but not blown through floors. And they just seem to be the newest thing for architect developers to make buildings look interesting and less bland. Which is like they should think about again uh, in their about their design, not in a formal way. Oh my God, we should have you know gotten out of formalism of of postmodernism, but we still seem to be in there, uh, which 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 is a shame. So again, we urge uh, the developing and architectural world to think more performatively than formally. Uh, next slide. That gave you a lot to think about. Share that with us, DeSoto. Well, one of the things that I really notice in this view of Chicago and the picture on the left is the density of the buildings. And I mean that in a positive way. These older cities and parts of downtown Honolulu, true, are, are like this as well, do have a tightness of how close all the buildings are together. And to me, that is a positive thing in terms of vitality and energy and how a city, I think a city should be. In other words, you have a lot of things together and that adds energy. What we are not doing in Honolulu with our current crop of high rises is mimicking that. And I don't think that's necessarily good. We've got a bunch of widely spaced high rises, each on its own raised parking plinth. That does mean that yes, there's air circulation, et cetera, but it does mean also that you have open spaces which nobody really goes to, nobody walks to, nobody travels between on foot because nothing's happening there. That is what Waikiki does have, which is why people still enjoy going there as tourists. It is not a tropical environment, but it is a dense urban environment in which there's a lot to see and a lot to do. So what we also talked about was how does this affect the performance of the building? In Chicago, it's not necessarily a good thing for buildings to be shading each other in the winter when you want to be gathering solar energy to help keep you warm because it gets really cold in Chicago. Whereas here, the denser the buildings are, they will in fact shade each other. That means that the denser the buildings are, there will be less direct sun on them, and that will keep our cooling costs down. So conjecturing, we could say that this density is perhaps better for Honolulu than it is for Chicago, but our current development of Honolulu is not like that. That's ironic, right? So if we import, we should switch. That's what you're saying, right? Right, right, right. Do what we see here, we want in Honolulu. And we learn once again from nature. We talked about bamboo groves, right? Where the plants are as close to each other as they need to be to shade each other, to keep themselves from getting dehydrated, but they're loose enough to still get air, light, and rain into it. So right. a bichromatic building code, which this one here is, is demonstrating, as, as we will see further down in the show, that's we have been investigating that with the emerging generation in jungleism, where skinny towers are positioned in such a way. Here. Yeah. So this is interesting. So here at the very left of the big picture, you see these two towers uh, that we saw in the previous slides here. And it also shows, depending on the time of the day, the angle, uh, the way you hold your camera, admittingly too, they look either bluish or greenish, uh, but doesn't really matter because again, they're not really performing, uh, living up to uh, the environment in such a way. It needs to be the evolution of the generation of glass high rises. And here, uh, this group of buildings is really iconic. Uh, the very right building on this bigger picture here is the Chicago Tribune Tower. 
that was one, if not the most spectacular architectural competition at the beginning of the last century. That uh, architects who bit, who had names at that time, like Gropius from Germany and Saarinen from the, well, he's American, immigrated, but originally from Scandinavia, and the Saarinens, I should say, Eliel. That was still Eli Eliel, the the father of Aero. They were all participating, but Americans won. Uh, Howells and Hood, Raymond A. M. Hood is the architect of the tower with his partner, a business partner here, and that's the Chicago Tribune Tower where the main newspaper in Chicago is uh, been printed or has been printed because in the next slide, which we'll probably talk about uh, in the next show and not today because we have to stay on this one for a little longer here, um, uh, is, uh, but thanks for having shown it anyways, Eric, that was good glimpse, good pre-glimpse, uh, was the architect. And these were the times when um, basically uh, stereotomic construction as we also will show um, a little later down in the show here, had ended where there was one building that we will feature, which is the Manadnock building, which was still built primarily predominantly with brick, ending up being massive, at least at its base, and then tapering, getting thinner to the top. That era then had ended once steel was introduced. And steel allowed uh, the building then to be glad with anything, but architects at that time didn't feel comfortable until really Mies van der Rohe and Lake Shore Drive apartments that we featured, which are, by the way, not that far away from here. You can reach them in like 10 minutes foot walk to the left, so to speak, on this picture here as orientation. Uh, architects still felt more comfortable to flat them with stone as they did, but they did in different ways. You see at the very left is probably from the mid-century, from the 50s or 60s, as an international style building where one facade, uh, very sort of surprisingly, because it's facing Michigan Avenue, which the nickname is the Magnificent Mile. That's the equivalent to Kalakaua Avenue, glitzy, glitzy, going to uh, Waikiki. This is where the main high-end shopping is. And to make an opaque, austere facade facing that is rather surprising. And then you see the other facade, you see Rockefeller-like emphasizing, or Rockefeller Center-like uh, New York City, emphasizing the verticality in there and inserting the, the windows as bands into there. So this is, this is interesting. Uh, on the right side, that little skinny image there is a proposal by the architect Smith and Gill. And that name uh, rings a bell because we've been talking about Adrian Smith, who was with SOM uh, when uh, I took the students there uh, the last time in my prairie days, and they were uh, shocking us with the projects on their table, which one was the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower that just wants to look like a desert flower and has no ambition to perform like that. And the other one is which we don't want to talk about either, but we have to because it's associated to a gentleman that will always be addressed in the show following our show, which is the former and hopefully not again, President Trump, who also had to leave his uh, poop print mark here with uh, um, Adrian Smith having helped him, which is the Trump Tower. And there is this little um, um, image here at the very bottom in the middle that is from the Chicago Tribune. These icons basically show the competition of height that these buildings are doing. And one is still sort of unbeaten uh, in its pole position. And that's by the original firm that Gordon, uh, Adrian Smith, his partners, first and his business partners is Gordon Gill. Uh, they were not, no one was beating that. And this is the firm they worked for, SOM. This is the Sears Tower, now Willie's Tower. But this proposal here will go and basically be the second tallest and that way even beat Mr. Trump and also beat who had just, you know, very bravely fought her way up there, literally and figuratively speaking, as one of the few, too few female architects, Jeannie Gang. This building will basically put that on number four. And it is a very tall building, as we've been pointing out and been talking about. It's also very skinny. It's kind of a bundle skinny. So that one um, is not built, but it, uh, it's intended to be built on the uh, east side of the historic tower. And uh, one thing we were talking about that uh, Adrian was basically splitting off SOM by saying, I want to be more sustainable than this big firm has ever been. 
And he built a China, a, a building in China, a town in China that we have been sharing and showing that tried to do that, has a lot of whistles and bells, uh, a lot of um, high, high tech uh, features in order to do that. So you would hope that this new tower here would follow this his own footsteps. But what you and I decided to do, just because no one else does it, uh, not that we are trained or born to do this, what we're doing, having become this our city's main architectural critics, uh, in Chicago, it has a professional, that's Blair Kamen. He's a very esteemed and actually Pulitzer Prize awarded, rightly so, writer. And he um, uh, had an article about this tower, and he hasn't been talking about that, which makes me suspicious. He had talked about a postmodern feature, uh, which, uh, which, who is also a headquartered in Chicago? Who, who, which character from the movies, the sort of? Batman. Exactly. So Blair was saying the top of the building might remind one of the ears of Batman. <laughs> okay, whatever. But that's postmodernism. Reminds us also uh, of not very far away from here. Stanley Tiger Man's at the peak of the postmodern, probably most famous example of a Rolls Royce grill um, decorated parking garage, but we should have been going past these times, which just makes us curious if. Because the tower, and as you look at it, it has, it's not the generic tower as the ones on the very left, where the fenestration is the same all around. This has very distinctively different facades to uh, basically north and south and east and west. So let's keep the hopes up and hope uh, Adrian and Gordon will still infuse that their sustainability uh, sales pitch, uh, you know, trademark to this building as well, because otherwise, again, it would be disappointing. Anyways, I think that's it for this week. It has to be because we're at the end of another 28 minutes to continue with this, comparing to cities that seem to want to learn from each other in certain ways should, and sometimes in the opposite ways as we figure it today. So with that, until next week, where hopefully you will join us again. Stay easy breezy, breezy easy. We have uh, Kaili Chun, who is the author of the Easy Breezy Term, uh, educate us about um, her culture and your culture, Hawaiian culture, tomorrow in school, which we can also desperately need. So see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.